This tricky topic will examine stress and the immune response. If we look back at the physiology of the stress response, we see that stress induces a long cascade of neurotransmitter and then hormonal release, moving from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland and then to the adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland then secretes cortisol from its cortex and epinephrine from its medulla. Once these chemicals diffuse into the body, both cortisol and norepinephrine have been shown to influence the number of immune cells produced in the body, inferring that stress can indeed affect the immune system. This is an extremely important implication for many aspects of our lives and health, and sets up the point of focus for this tricky topic. However, before moving forward, we must first briefly discuss the importance of the immune system. We'll begin by looking at three very basic elements involved in the immune system response. The first are antigens, and these are foreign substances like chemicals, bacteria, viruses, or pollen that cause your immune system to produce antibodies against them. And antibodies are large proteins that bind to antigens, allowing the immune system to recognize these foreign antigen substances. And then finally, the third very basic element of the immune system would be the immune system cells themselves. And that would be killer cells primarily, of which there are two major types, those being natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells. And these cells bind to and destroy foreign substances mediated by this antibody binding mechanism. If we look at the immune system in a broader sense, it's a system of many biological structures and processes within an organism that protects it against disease, inspects the body for cells that may take on dangerous mutations, and performs basic housekeeping functions like cleaning up cellular debris after cellular injury. And the immune system can be subdivided into two basic lines of defense, natural immunity and acquired immunity. Now, natural immunity is the first line of defense against foreign agents, that is antigens, and it's an inborn process for removing antigens from the body. This response is usually immediate as well as nonspecific in that it will attack any antigen present. So a quick example would be cutting your finger. And when you cut your finger, your finger becomes very inflamed and blood vessels contract and dilate to increase the flow of blood to that area. Where in addition to the dilated blood vessels, damaged cells will release chemicals to signal for specialized immune cells to come and destroy invading microorganisms, thus protecting your body from the infection. So let's say we have all of our antigens entering. Antibodies will then bind these, and this will cue for your immune system cells to come and destroy these antigens and prevent them from entering the bloodstream and infecting your body. The second type of immunity is acquired immunity, and this is much more complex and requires a number of endocrine and cellular processes. This sector will recognize specific antigens and then reproduce specialized cells or circulating proteins to fight these antigens. What makes acquired immunity unique is that it requires experience. That is, it must have had a prior exposure to a specific antigen in order to respond to it effectively. So for example, let's say you get a cold from virus X. Your body will develop an immune response to this specific virus X such that you will be less likely to get sick when exposed to virus X a second time. And this might be more familiar to you when you think about the common vaccine, which you use to protect your body from further infection and disease. This is tapping into acquired immunity that allows this vaccine to actually work and protect you from illness. And moving on, what we see is that the physiological effects of stress, when sustained over time, will weaken both aspects of the immune system, where subsequently this immunosuppression will increase susceptibility to disease because of the body's diminished ability to fight invading antigens or damaged cells. And with this in mind, we'll now go over some of the research that has allowed us to make these conclusions linking both psychological and physical health. Research from many animal studies has shown that both psychological and physical stressors have had effects on the immune system, and these stressors on animals include maternal stressors, inescapable shock, abrupt temperature change, loud noise, and many more. And following this, what all these studies have shown is that they've seen a reduction in response to antigens, a reduction in the number of immune cells present 
and an overall decrease of immune system function. Following this, some studies have looked at naturally occurring stressors in human subjects and examined changes in these individuals' respective immune system functioning. Naturally occurring stressors like final exams, sleep deprivation, divorce, loud noise, or caring for an Alzheimer's or AIDS patient have all been studied and shown collectively again to produce reductions in immune system response or function. Following these results, it's important to note that these studies infer that stress can indeed cause a reduction in immune system functioning, but it has not told us whether or not this necessarily affects the actual health of the individual. This last question is asked and answered in the following two experiments that we're going to look at. In the first experiment, conducted in 1995, two different groups were assembled. The first group, Group A, was of individuals who were currently the primary care providers for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And the second group, Group B, was a control group. So this presumed that those taking care of individuals with Alzheimer's disease would have higher levels of psychological stress. Following this, each individual within each group was given a small puncture wound and followed up by assessing two separate factors. The first was testing for the concentration of different immune variables in the blood, so that's measuring the immune system response, where a greater concentration means a bigger immune system response. And the second looked at the actual wound healing process, so the amount of time it took for the small puncture wound to heal, thus measuring the direct health of the individuals. In both cases, what they found, first pertaining to the immune variables in the blood, was that group A patients had significantly fewer than group B. As well with wound healing, it actually took much longer for group A to have these small wounds heal than those in group B who experienced a greater wound healing speed. This suggests that stress does induce diminished effects in the immune system, subsequently resulting in, as shown here, direct effects to the health of the individuals as well, where here it's exemplified by the actual healing of the small puncture wound. Following this, in the second study, researchers took a group of individuals and assessed them on three aspects of their lives. These were their self-reported amount of perceived stress, the social networks they had available to them, and then finally the amount of external stressors as determined by the researchers. They then exposed these individuals to the common cold and determined their susceptibility to it. And in conclusion, they determined that the most prominent predictor of whether or not an individual got sick was their perceived level of stress. So this tells us that it's the individual's own subjective experience of their level of stress that determines its effects on the immune system and thus their health. That concludes this tricky topic looking at stress and the immune response. Thank you for listening.